Welcome to Heart Speak with your host, Naomi Hori. Speaker, healer, intuitive, and teacher Naomi Hori is here to provide conversations featuring experts from all ranges of specialties, including heart based poet, spiritual teachers, and many others. So sit back and get ready to be inspired. Please welcome the host of Heart Speak, Naomi Hori. Welcome to Heart Speak with Naomi Hari, and I'm your host, Naomi. We're live from Bold Brave TV with special guest, poet and author, Virgil Suarez. Virgil, thank you so much for being on the show. I've been a big fan of your work for decades. <laughs> thank you, Naomi. And you've been supportive for many, many decades. Oh. <laughs> uh, when we first met, I think at an AWP, and then you supported my work in Many Mountains Moving, I think, right? Yes, yeah. It's, it's been a long time. It's amazing how time flies when you are writing poetry and, and, and hiding in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's been so fun to kind of witness your evolution because back then I didn't know you're also a visual artist and you have such beautiful work. And I remember, you know, with the literary journal many mountains moving we would just get boxes and boxes of manuscripts and your you know we could publish less than one percent of what came in because there was just so much and yours just popped out and screamed <laughs> because they were so amazing yeah. thank you well we you know we, we we've always done art it's just like and we had always written poetry uh but my writing life started as a novelist i was writing fiction uh, but all along, I was doing both paintings, mixed media art, and writing poetry. It's just that I never really, uh, it wasn't until my late 20s, early 30s, that I started feeling comfortable enough to share it. And then once I did, I realized, well, I need to get it out there. Yes, it's gorgeous. Would you mind, I have some of your pieces of art here. Would you mind if I shared it on camera? Oh, and you know, there's some back here too. Like ah, that. okay, okay, yeah. yeah. So all of you can can uh, this admire. Is the, uh, this is our living living room where we have a lot of art, um, which actually, um, one of the things that happened during you know the the the, the time the pandemic while we were here at home started contacting other uh, artists and saying, listen, you know, would you mind? um exchanging art and a lot of them came through and so in in the three in the last three four years our uh, art collection has grown substantially because i keep trading you know i don't sell my work um i just i, I either trade it or give it away to to good friends and family and uh, the reason for that is that when i visit then i get to see it uh, you know, I get to forget about it and then also see it uh, mm. when I visit them. Um, and also, you know, I get I get to have uh, people whose work I really like hanging up on the walls and it's like visiting friends, you know. So, yeah, yeah. these walls are full of art. Um, this is our high ceiling uh, living room area where we where it's just wall, wall to wall art with very little space left. So that's that's beautiful and i remember when you posted on facebook inviting artists to to share their work and i thought what a beautiful way to create community in a lonely time in history in in a lonely uh trade too because when you're an artist or a writer you're often just alone <laughs> working on your craft so i thought that yeah was i mean that's too. that's all that's all it is and and to me and it's part of the reason why i even though I do, I, I did go to school for for art, uh, and then later creative writing. Uh, most of the time, I've worked uh, alone. I normally don't show my work uh, to people, and I like the idea that um, you know it has to please me first, and then I send it out. Like with the poetry, I love to hear um and see what 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 the way people react to my poetry and and literary magazines are important because they're the first step on my way to creating the next book i like to get the work out and see if i'm headed in the right direction you know i don't do it necessarily for approval 
but I do like sharing. I mean, I, I can't imagine being an artist in the world and never sharing your work. I think uh, even though, I mean, the only one of the few examples uh, that was kind of tragic that happened in the 20th century was of course, uh, Vivian Mayer, uh, uh, you can look at her documentary. I think it's still on Netflix, but um, she was a great photographer, never showed her work to anybody. And then this kid discovered her negatives uh, because he bought this uh, empty, not empty, but uh, one of these, um, um, you know, storage spaces. And in there he found, I don't know, uh, thousands of these negatives. And, and very quickly Vivian Maher was discovered and was able to see the light. Otherwise we would have never known her work. So I, yeah. I think if you're an artist, uh, whatever whatever genre you're into, get out there and, and, and show it while you're still here. Otherwise, you know, it defeats the purpose. But I, I also recommend not doing it for either accolades or pats on the back or approval. You know, do, do your art, do the way that you want to do it and uh, and move it along. It's, it's, it's become kind of a ritual, which mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm very addicted to uh, working by myself and then uh, eventually I send out some work, people like it or not like it, right? Um, I, I do a lot of work these days through Submittable, which I kind of like. Back in the day, it was the, um, the, the, you know, you had to run to the post office and you had to uh, lick stamps and seal envelopes and all of that. Now Submittable makes it really easy for a huge community of both editors and writers uh, to stay in touch with one another and figure out what's what they're interested in publishing. So I find it an extremely valuable tool and it's available to all poets and writers out there and also artists. Today I answered the question, somebody emailed me and said, how do I get uh, my work, my artwork into uh, literary magazines? I go, well, go to Submittable and put in art as a, as a search word and it'll it'll get you all the magazines that are looking for um, for for art to to publish so it's a very handy tool i love it yeah and and what you're talking about too is such a a fine balance isn't it uh for artists of any genre just uh, doing it for ourselves to express our divine voice in a way or our creative voice or whatever unique perspectives uh that we want to share and then being okay with it maybe being out in the world or not being out in the world in a way. But yeah, I, I remember that story of the photographer and was so moved by it. And you have other stories like the guy that wrote Confederacy of Dunces who yeah. tried and tried and tried to get his novel out and could nobody would publish it. And then he, he passed away and his mother went and, and and took it everywhere and finally got it published and then it was on the bestseller list and and it's like in a in a way that was huge because people all over the world were reading it but in a way it also doesn't even matter because he created it you know and that was a beautiful thing in of itself it's it's a right. fine line <laughs> yeah no and I, and I think in case I mean I, I the terrifying thought for me there is all of the folks over the uh, over the thousands of years who maybe were creative types, uh, writers, painters, and painted, wrote, and their work never saw the light of day, you know? I mean, we wouldn't have Emily Dickinson, uh, it seems to me, if uh, whatever his name was, who found her uh, folio and uh, and then went ahead and published the work. I mean, there are writers and, and, and artists out there who need to be pushed a little bit to get that work out. Uh, but as I tell my students, if you don't, if you don't, if you're not proactive in the process of sending out your work and getting it into the light, nobody's going to do it for you, you know, and in, and in all likelihood, uh, you know, your time will pass and your work will not be seen. So, um, you know, and, and I think living in a community of other artists, I think even though as lonely as one might feel, all you have to do is look around and there are other people who will then influence you or inspire you, uh, befriend you, and all of a sudden you're inside of a community, not a very large community, but it's a community, an important community nonetheless. So I, I like that. And I think during the pandemic, 
we were into making those kinds of uh, contacts and friendships um, because people, I think, were very hungry for for human contact uh, outside of, even though we use social media, outside of social media. Um, so it's uh, a lot of a lot of Zoom uh, calls, you know, telephone calls, that kind of thing. And we got to know each other fairly well uh, through that. So a lot of good friendships were made in those years. And I'm very uh, happy about that. Yeah, and and I think one of your gifts uh, really is you, you have such a big and beautiful heart and that comes through in your visual art and your uh, in your teaching in your poetry and and just walking around in the world. It's it's beautiful. Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very happy to uh, be alive. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sort of a um... I mean, I wouldn't call myself uh, a, a believer or a big spiritual being, but I do have, you know, certain beliefs and certain rituals that I do practice as a writer. Uh, and, you know, I don't know, I don't know the answers to the big questions, but in my, in, in the journey through the art and through the writing, I get to feel fairly alive and fairly human. And I like sharing that, you know, I respect people's beliefs. Uh, uh, you know, and um, but it's it's it seems to me that it's the questioning through the work yeah. where I arrive at the present moment where I think I'm really happy to uh, to be here in the world with so many wonderful people and uh, be able to share uh, in their work and share my work. So, um, I mean, I, I think that's a sort of a communion uh, amongst artists that is that is very important in a country. Uh, where uh, it's more important than ever uh, to be able to be aware that there are other people like you, you know, uh, in the last 10 years or maybe even longer, uh, we've had, you know, we've been battling uh, the government in terms of assistance to writers and artists. And um, and so it's very important to, to build that kind of community where you can help, in particular, help young people uh, come into it. And uh, the way that I think I help them is I always tell them, which is something that I heard Ray Bradbury uh, say once uh, when he visited my high school, which was, you don't need to ask anybody uh, for permission to to do your thing. You know, whether you want to recite a poem on the street corner, put up a play, you don't need anybody's permission. But, you know, we live in such a rich uh, country that it, it behooves us to support our artists as much as is humanly possible. And that support has dwindled down, you know, over the last three decades or so. Um, so it's it's important that we do find support among each other uh, to be able to continue otherwise. And don't depend on it from anybody else. You know, whether it's, I, I've gotten state grants, uh, I've, I've received the National Endowment of the Art and, and that I'm forever grateful. Uh, and it came in very handy, but uh, I tell my students, you know, you have to go about it as if none of this is ever going to happen to you and nobody's going to be supportive. So you have to do it because you feel it and it's in your blood, right? It's under your skin and you must do it because that's what it calls you to do. So it's, a, it, you know, it's um, it, it's definitely a privilege and an honor to, to be able to do it like this. You know? Yeah, yeah. It is so important for for writers and artists to have their power and, and their motivation and just do it no matter what, even if they never get any support. And, and also so important, I think that we as enjoyers of art, whether that's watching a show on TV, that that's written, that's acted, that's, you know, the music, uh, the musicians who make it, all of it, uh, you know, is from art and it's important for us to to support those things too so we can continue to enjoy art which is everything about being human so um yeah it it looks like it's a time for a little break a message from our sponsors and we'll be right back with more with virgil suarez what if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair what if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? 
Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick. Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to EasySense.com and learn how, with your help, we can fight these horrific brain disorders. That's EasySense.com to learn more and help support the Broderick Foundation. Author, radio show host, and coach, John M. Hawkins, reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. We're back with HeartSpeak with Naomi Hari. I'm your host, and we're live with Bold Brave TV Network, here with poet and artist Virgil Suarez. Virgil, I'd love to ask you to share a few of your favorite poems. And, and real quick, I also want to share with everyone um, one of your pieces that I love. Uh, this is this reminds me of a, like an intergalactic meeting or something. It's it's yeah. so high va- vibration and I, I just love it. I'm not showing it well, but uh, I'm blood, here, but I'm you get the you idea. <laughs> I love it and I'm, I'm now, now fixing it. Yeah. Now I'm fixing exactly up my right office. Is. Yes, I uh, and I'm I'm gonna put it in the frame and all, all your pieces and, and a nice section of the wall and stuff when I get my office finished. Yeah, and so if you wouldn't mind sharing a few poems. Well, yeah, yeah. I now this is the um, this is the book, you know that uh, it's available on Amazon and. Uh, when I was putting it together, I had already spent a whole bunch of years going out on the road and taking photographs. So I had the photographs, including uh, photographs that I finally visit Detroit and took pictures of Detroit. A lot of um, these amazing, beautiful buildings that have been abandoned in the last three, four decades. So I took pictures. I, um, I had a lot of art. But I, I was working on poems um, for, for the book. And so I, um, as always, I returned to my childhood. My childhood has always been uh, because I grew up in Cuba. I was born in Cuba in 1962. And I lived in Cuba for those first 10 years. And then we went off to uh, Spain. And I've never been back to Cuba. So. Um, my my memories of my childhood are extremely fertile. And so I, I started writing these poems, right, uh, that dealt with not only historical time, but also with the kinds of things that uh, I remembered, uh, you know, my mother doing or participating in. And so this is a poem called The Cotton Ball Queen. In 1970, Havana, Cuba, my mother took it upon herself to inject B12 on the butt cheeks of as many neighbors as brought doses and paid for her service. My mother wanted to be a nurse, but was not a nurse. The house filled with women waiting for their shots, and I, age eight, watched them lower one side of their pants or shorts or pull up a dress to to expose their flesh to the needle. The needle disappeared into the flesh. My mother swabbed their skin with a cotton ball drenched in alcohol after each shot and threw it in a bucket by the kitchen door. When she was not looking, I reached in for a handful and went outside to look at how the blood darkened. 
I wrapped my toy soldiers in the used cotton. They were wounded. Cuba was sending military personnel to Vietnam. My mother shot up more people, the you know sick people, as she called them. When my father came home, there was no trace of anyone ever having been over. My mother expected me to keep her secrets. On the mud fort I had built in the patio, all my soldiers lay wounded, bloodied and dying. At night, I dreamt of white pillowcases filling with bloody cotton balls. In the United States, my mother worked in a factory sewing zippers at 10 cents a piece, 25 years. She never looked up from her machine. Her fingers became arthritic. Every time I cut myself shaving, I reached for a cotton ball to soak up the blood. Blood is a red bird taking flight against the darkening sky. So, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's work like that, right? That is always driving me towards not only gathering the memory and trying to get the, uh, actually, I think that's my Roomba in the background making that noise, sorry. Um, so it, it's about, you know, kind of gathering and recollecting the memory, but turning, turning it into what I would consider a poem, in this case, a poem I liked, you know, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what a powerful poem. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Would you like to share another one? Yes, of course. I can, we can share a lot of poems. <laughs> um, this is, you know, uh, the thing about this book um, is that during the pandemic, I started thinking about, I was doing research on, you know, why, why do people abandon their homes? What happens? Uh, both uh, natural disasters and also uh, man-made disasters, the way that Chernobyl was. Uh, and this is a poem about the Katrina, what Katrina did to New Orleans. Uh, and it's called The Waters This Time. Uh, and it's got a little epigram for a Memphis a Mini. If it keeps on raining, the levee is going to break Memphis Mini. Happy shotgun houses swallowing oh. Katrina's deluge bloated bodies floating down the street, rare fish in the morning light after thunder and lightning punctuated the night with the call and response of the living, oil slick water catching the light, crows iridescent to feather, folks bracing each other on rooftops, weather vanes pointing anywhere but here, many more drown inside their houses, a maelstrom of furniture and keepsakes a fall painting of a white Jesus plummeting to darker, darker depths. A boy screams in the distance. He does not want to leave. Grandmother naked in the water. Such horror does not know the color of electric water. John boats take people in quartets. Their waterlogged hope diminishing returns of someone left behind. Fetid air sky the color of zombies like in the setting of a B movie except this is as real as it gets. And what of a government that abandons people, huddle masses at the Superdome, an egg-shaped carapace from the sky, bleached and pockmarked with trash and bitterness. If you are black, you are crap out of luck. But so it always goes in this country of six spin and jive turkeys. The water offers no baptism, no rebirth for all those bust to Baton Rouge, Houston and beyond, who will come back home? Someone says they are trying to whiten the Crescent City, view carré of dreams. No, sir, not this water, not this time, not ever again. The waters this time cannot be forgiven. The next time the levee breaks, there will be hell to pay. So, you know, some, some of it is, uh, is, is tough, uh, you know, material. It's a kind of, you know, through memory, you begin to relive so much of the pain. And, um, you know, those of us who've been writing uh, or arting for a long time, you know, we, we see things and it takes a while, but uh, what we see gets internalized and then somehow it has to come out, you know. Uh, and I remember like you and many, many millions of people watching uh, the, the, you know, that horrible scene in New Orleans during Katrina. And uh, 
And even though I didn't react to it right away uh, in terms of what it meant, what it was about, uh, it took a while. And then eventually, you know, right at the start of the pandemic, I started thinking about things like that and, and, you know, crafting work out of those experiences. And that's what, you know, that's my approach to, to the writing is about, you know, how do I craft art out of these uh, often brutal uh, moments, uh, things that you see that you cannot uh, unsee, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and to me, it's a kind of maybe a catharsis, a kind of exorcism uh, of sorts, right? Um, and, and it doesn't often make for good art, but it, but all of it makes me feel uh, better, right? Uh, healed, more, more balanced, uh, that, that I'm able to express myself and get, and get those, get that venom or, or as I call them, uh, poisons out of my system, you know, through the writing, through uh, the creative process. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I think it, it's really healing for everyone, even when you're writing about trauma or things like that. It, it's, it's almost like the idea of homeopathics, where you put a little bit of that poison to heal the similar uh, symptoms or something. So it is very healing. Plus, you, you have strong ties to uh, Louisiana, too, because didn't you go get your master's from there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. At LSU. I received yeah. my MFA from uh, from LSU in Baton Rouge. Yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. you know, the time there was idyllic. I had a wonderful, wonderful time. But I do remember, right, uh, sort of the uh, the attitude of the entire state towards uh, New Orleans, which is uh, one of those rare gems in terms of cities in this country, like, for example, uh, San Francisco, New York, uh, on that on the, on the top five list of amazing cities in the United States, I think uh, New Orleans would be um, up there. Uh, and um, I remember uh, the whole talk about, you know, New Orleans being Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's what uh, that's what Louisianians thought of of, of, of the people uh, who lived in New Orleans. Right. Not I mean, the people who live in New Orleans have their own character and they're they love life. They love eating. They love music. Uh, so I could see how the rest of the state is a little jealous. Uh, and they also bring in millions upon millions of tourist dollars. So it's, mm. you know, it, it, I spent as much time as it was humanly possible in New Orleans. Um, and my wife and I still go every year. Sometimes we go twice a year and visit. Uh, it, it's a very unique city. And come to find out when you look at the history, uh, Cuba and Louisiana have had a long history um of uh, communication and exchanges right um they had a uh, leper colony <clears throat> in one Ooh. of the parishes and the last they had a lot of uh, cuban patients who uh, were brought there and who were left there and uh, they the last couple of people who died uh were these cuban patients who have been brought in uh, early in the 20th century to be cured of leprosy. So it, it's interesting, you know, when you start digging the history, right? Yeah. So, yeah. I, I didn't know about that history. I yeah. I had visited New Orleans once and for work and I, I loved it so much. And I, I was thinking of moving there actually because the taxi driver's like, oh, because I worked as a pianist. And he's like, oh, you should come uh, come live here because we're always, you know, there's lots of work for pianists and things like that. And, and I remember Katrina so strongly too, because actually when I had my cancer surgery and they had given me like a 7% chance of survival and things like that. And after the surgery, I woke up and and that was on the news everywhere. And my father tried to like turn off the TV so yeah. I wouldn't see and, and be upset for the people. But I, I'm, I'm so grateful those that survived that we're all still here. And I, I feel so much for those that are gone and, and, and everyone left that misses them too. It's, um, you know, and I know nature and, and also the underdog are big themes in, in your work as well. Um, you know, do you have anything you'd like to say about uh, about that or other themes in your work? Because well, I think a lot of always, it, it's oh. what always appeals to me, right? I, you hear, like for example, the first time I heard about these Cuban 
um, leprosy uh, patients who came to Louisiana. I, I knew, hearing it for the first time, I knew that eventually I would do something about it. And to this day, I have not written a word about it, but it's very much part of uh, my little book of, uh, you know, I, I take notes, I keep track of these things uh, that I try to keep on my radar. So later on, I can uh, come back and, and write about them. And, you know, it's a full, I, I've been keeping journals for years now. So there's always ideas that I can go and revisit and see how I can mine them, right? So eventually, yes, uh, what I've heard of the place, which fascinates me, is that it's it's abandoned, it's there, and and people, um, those of us who are uh, what what are we what are we, you know the people who are uh, going in to these abandoned places to take photographs, um, you know that they still have uh, the place fairly intact. Where even uh, I've heard that they have uh, the the part of the place that was a morgue have these jars and and I'm thinking how is this possible that they just basically lock up a place and leave it intact for people to you know uh, urban explorer explorers that that's the word I was looking for those of us who do a lot of urban exploration uh, I would love to to visit a place like that and, and take photographs and I have seen uh, people who have actually written on the place and taken photographs of the place as it is right now. So it's there and again, nobody's looking after it. I don't, I don't think the state is doing anything with it, but it's yeah. part of the history of the place, you know? And so I, I have a need often to see the place myself just to get the vibes and maybe tune into whatever voices are gonna be begin to speak through me. Not that I'm a medium or anything like that, but I mean, you know, I, I, uh, I do, I, I, I'm sensitive to uh, those voices that begin to speak. In yeah, my yeah I, I think we're all mediums in some way and especially artists and, and writers, yeah. but uh, yeah, it, it looks like it's time for an, a new break uh, from our sponsors. And when we come back, I'd love to ask you to teach us some of the rituals um, to help us tap into our creative voice. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy sense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals john m hawkins new book Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Welcome back to Heart Speak with Naomi Hari. Thanks for hanging out with us and enjoying this wonderful conversation live with Bold Brave TV here with Virgil Suarez, poet and artist. Virgil, could you um, could you teach us how to 
access our creative voice or get in that creative space or whatever you'd like to share um, some ritual or tips you have? Well, the, you know, the, the question is, uh, and personally, this is a very good question for me to always answer, which is, where does the work come from? And more often than not, and I don't know if it's, I mean, it's part of my ritual, but I, I don't know if I would dare call it a meditation of sorts, but I do begin with, uh, and you don't have to close your eyes, but I do begin by traveling to a particular moment uh, whether it's recent or way in the back, right, uh, way way in my in my past, and I start thinking about uh, not necessarily the voice that's going to be giving us the poem, but uh, sort of the, the the basic questions, right, the who, what, when, and where. I start thinking of the sensory, um, you know, information that I that I want. Uh, including colors, smells. I, I, I write a lot about foods for that reason, because uh, when you're cooking uh, and you become familiar with spices and, and all of these things, you know, you have to, you, you, I think you begin to practice and exercise your uh, sense of smell, for example. Uh, with colors, it's the same thing. Uh, it helps if you are, you know, if you're an artist, because that way you already have kind of a vocabulary uh, that includes uh, just different colors than just the primary colors. But for me, the ritual, the, the, the ritual that I'd say has been with me for the last 30 years as a writer is that I will, I will, I will hear something or I will see something or something will come on my radar you know, and then I start thinking about it and, and the thought doesn't leave me. And I and I think, what does this have to do with me? What does this have to do with me? And more often than not, that question gives me an answer that is somewhere in my past. And I'm going to illustrate it uh, with a poem that is very uh, recent. I think most people remember, I hope most people remember this. Uh, this maybe is from um late last year early this year um it's a it's a it's a short poem it's called chinese weather balloon and i'm gonna and i'm gonna walk you through uh wh why i wrote it and, and 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 what it you know what it does to my ritual right chinese weather balloon plenty of room in this country for a lost weather balloon silver and glowing in the blue stratosphere but visible if you squint long enough in, in your eyes water. Force majeure, easy to let the currents carry you, weightless, like the feeling you get in a roller coaster's free fall. An American parachutist died during B the Bay of Pigs invasion, and somehow my aunt got her hands on the material and brought it to my mother so she could make my aunt her wedding dress. There were dark red smears on the smooth fabric. Spy balloon my ass. This one was a birthday gift for a child alien from a distant galaxy whose father promised a trip to Disneyland. On course, the child let it slip and now it hangs over Montana, then Kansas, adrift and rudderless like the rest of us. Half of the country demands it be shot down and eventually it is eight miles off the coast of South Carolina. So much anticipation and deflation, a dead and bloated jellyfish on the surface of the Atlantic. What is a poet to do but write to a friend to say, next time a Chinese weather balloon floats overhead, he will shoot it down and make a dress and matching crown with its luminous material. All of this to tell you, I'm learning how to sew. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a melange. It, it's, um, I, I begin writing, trying to get at the basics of, of the initial idea, right? The Chinese, and oftentimes it goes with the title, right? I think of the title, Chinese Weather Balloon, and then I try to get at what the current event is. And then somehow, as I, I begin to write, that memory 
of myself remembering my aunt bringing this piece of cloth, which later I found out uh, came from a parachute. And so, and I didn't know, I didn't know that that information was in me. I had to call my mother to verify it, right? And I'm thinking how wonderful the world is where you can get all of these bits and pieces that are inside you and be able to craft in this case, a poem, or it could be a piece of art, but you know, those images and uh, those words coming together delight uh, the heck out of me and uh, proves that my journey is true as somebody who wants to tell a different story uh, than the normal story of what really happened, which was, you know, um, who knows where those balloons are coming from, but they enter our airspace, they capture our imagination, um, it's the letdown because eventually they shoot it. And so it, it has a particular feel to it, but I wanted to own it. And by going back into my past, um, then I, 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 I do that, right? I end up owning uh, the idea and, um, and the images. And that's how I work. And this is how I encourage my students to work. Uh, you, you think about something and then you undoubtedly have to put yourself uh, in it and find your own meaning into, into the piece to figure out, you know, what kind of journey you're on, you know? And then I've been, I've been a, an eyewitness. I've been a bystander uh, since 1974 living in the United States. And I'm never bored. We live in a fantastic country where the last thing you want to complain about is being bored because there is no such thing. Uh, there's always something happening at the corner or nearby that is absolutely fascinating and breathtaking, you know. And so I, I keep my eyes and ears open and, um, and do that, you know. I, I love that. So if you're if you're listening at home or uh, or or watching, this is a great exercise you can do on your own. And I I love uh, that example of how you can take something global or international and then bringing it into the personal realm like that with with that detail, like the cloth. That's I, and I love the poem. Thank you, Virgil. Well, yeah. Thank you. Uh, you know, the, the musicians always say this, which is, mm -hmm. you know, when you hear a particular song that you hear for the first time and like, years down the line, you know, they say, you know, where were you? What were you doing? Who were you the day you heard a particular, you know, Nirvana's uh, teen spirit or what have you, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that that's the usual trigger is to move you, to transport you to another time and moment in your life when you can literally wax poetic about it and, and find maybe some lost meaning, right? If I hadn't written that poem, I, I, it would have, I would have never gotten to the idea that my aunt had gotten her hands on this parachute that was used in uh, Bay of Pigs and, you know, that kind of history uh, would have been uh, lost. But yeah, my yeah. mother made, made a dress out of it and it's like, okay, cool, because my mother's a seamstress and she's very good at it. Yes, that that's awesome. And and I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, well, so right now I'm I'm kind of having this amazing experience of uh, one of my creative partners is is also my lover, and I, I call him my Jedi lover or whatever. But it's so fun because usually that creative process is so isolating for me, and then to be able to do, do that with a lover is so fun. And your wife. Delia Poe, I hope I'm pronouncing her name yes. right, please correct me, okay, is the co-editor of the anthology you did, Little Havana Blues, a Cuban-American anthology uh, published by Art Publico, and she's also a writer and translator and a scholar of U.S. Latino literature, and she's also a professor at FC, FSU, and what are some of the favorite things that you you enjoy about having, you know, being in a relationship with another writer and how does that inform each of your work? If well, when we first met, you know, earlier in our, our relationship, we shared a lot of work. She would read uh, my manuscripts. Oftentimes we kind of bounce ideas uh, back and forth. We still do it. Uh, but, you know, the thing is that I, in, I have been so prolific uh, that 
you know, I, I can't just, I have to save the good, the really good stuff to run by her. Otherwise, I, I would probably uh, drive her crazy if I showed her everything that I did so, uh, or that I do. So every once in a while, I, I will, when I feel good about a piece, I, I will show it to her. And oftentimes she's running ideas by me. Uh, we like to use each other for titles, right? We, she's got a very good knack for titles. And sometimes like creative titles in my case, it, it, and I have a kind of a forte for academic titles, uh, just in, 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 in the playfulness because academic, you know, scholarly titles are often very different than creative writing uh, titles, right? They have the, they, they necessitate the colon, right? Uh, so I'm constantly helping her out with it, but it, it's, um, we, we, we thrive. Uh, and that's always been the case. It's the reason why we've been married now for 33, 34 years. Uh, we thrive on conversation, you know, um, uh, she is a lot more uh, social than I am. I mean, during the pandemic, for example, I was I was so happy to be home 24 seven, but she started to get a little uh, antsy. And so, cause she likes to work outside of the house. She'll go to a coffee shop there, take her computer. I work, I could be, I could live at home all the time uh, and not, and I love it and, and not miss anything in part because I'm still tuned in. I mean, I know what's happening around me. I just don't have to be out there. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it's been a privilege to have another creative person and live with that person and share, right? Um, more often than not, uh, when she's looking at my art, it's it's a much more instant um, uh, sort of um, uh, reaction because she's looking at it. Whereas if I if I give her three or four poems, um, I, I don't expect a, an answer right away, right? Uh -huh. uh, and she'll tell me. She'll tell me what she likes and what she doesn't like. Um, and so it, it, it's it's helpful to have uh, an extra pair of eyes and ears. Um, and I think, you know, I, of course, I discourage it amongst my graduate students in part because more often than not, if you're going, if, you, if you're going into academia looking for work, uh, two poets married to each other are not going to fare well in the world because That's those funny. jobs would be very difficult, very difficult to get. Um, but, you know, um, it, it, it's been um, excellent to, to, uh, to, to be in a, in a relationship where there's a lot of give and take, creative give oh. and take. Yeah. Thank you so much, Virgil. And it, we're going to take another little break from our sponsors and we'll be right back. And I want to hear more about how people can see your readings, uh, purchase your books, etc. when we come back. Thank you. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy sense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals john m hawkins new book Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them. 
we discover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. We're back with Heart Speak with Naomi Hari. I'm your host, and we're live with Bold Brave TV Network, here with poet and artist Virgil Suarez. Virgil, how can people purchase your work or go hear you read from your books uh, or, or see more of your art? Well, I've, I've, I have yet to show my art uh, anywhere. Uh, I do have a website, you know. Um, the and I used to read uh, in public a lot more often than I do these days, but I still will have uh, Zoom readings, things like that. Uh, the work is available on Amazon. Uh, most of my publishers sell through Amazon, or you can go to your local uh, fine book seller and and order the books through them. If that is, if they don't have it, my last two collections of poems. Uh, are published by the University of Pittsburgh Press, and and it's a press that's readily available in most uh, bookstores, in particular bookstores that will have a poetry section. Uh, the beauty of this book, though, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about it, um, is that when the pandemic hit, I had already been learning um, a whole bunch of programs that I had wanted to learn. Um, including uh, Photoshop, uh, Lightroom, and InDesign. And at that point, when the pandemic hit, uh, what this idea was triggered, which was, why don't I do, why don't I design a coffee table top book that will include my poems, my art, and my photography? And I the more I thought about that, the more I realized that, in part because I, I had no idea how long we were going to be in the cycle of the pandemic. So I decided to design the book myself. I already had the, the all, of, all of the content. So it was a matter of orchestrating the way that the book was going to look. And at that point, I, I decided to self-publish it through Amazon because I since I was, I mean, I, I don't think I'm a household word when it comes to poetry, but I, I think I'm, I've been constant in my output of poetry. So I think a lot of people know who I am, but that is not the case with my art and my photography. And I didn't want to waste any time, um, you know, looking around for a publisher that might want to do photography, uh, art, uh, and mixed media art at that and uh and poetry so all of those things came together and i decided to do the book myself as a way also to answer a question that i always get from people is like how do i get my book published well back in the day you would find a way to a publisher and that required a lot of time in this day and age it could be instant. You have to, of course, have the have the content ready, and you have to know how to how to work the software to be able to design and publish the book. But you know, Kindle, uh, which is the the outfit that ended up publishing this book, uh, was there, and so I designed the book, and I thought I'm going to put it out. Also, that I, I was trying to. Oh, oh so, so sorry to interrupt you, Virgil. We're we're almost out, out of time, but I I wanted uh, real quick. Could you just say your website link for them? Oh, uh, oh, let me see. Uh, oh, I hope I remember it. It's a very odd um, website. Uh, it's www.q-zine.store. Okay. Okay. So, okay. and for those of you that are streaming at home, to uh, so it's Virgil S W uh, S U A with an accent R E Z, and you can uh, Google him. So, uh, thank yes. you so much for being on the show, Virgil. I'm such a fan yeah, of you and your work. Thank you. Big and hugs. Big oh, hugs. Big I've hugs seen to you, you in, too. Uh, in person in a long time, but I wish yes. you well. 
Thank you. And, and thank you all of you who are listening or watching for joining us today. Uh, join us next week for another great conversation, this time with intuitive and healer Judy Callie. I'm signing off live from Heart Speak with Naomi Hari from Bold Brave TV. This is your host saying, from my heart to yours. This has been Heart Speak with host Naomi Hori. Tune in each week as Naomi provides thought provoking talk with such guests as Angel Channeler, a dance teacher, embodying a spiritual and philosophical foundation, an animal communicator, a medium, an astrologer, a spiritual warrior, and more. Right here, Fridays at 2 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave TV Network.